Well, good afternoon, everybody. So glad you're here today. Uh, see some new folks here today. And uh, so nice to, to have you here. Ron and Angie Negret. And uh, they're new to us today. Um, in fact, I just met Ron. I didn't get to meet Angie yet, but um, she spoke to me. Um, which was nice. It was nice that you spoke to me. <laughs> Um, we're just glad to have you here today, and um, there's a special treat for us, as you found out already, and you're welcome just to go ahead and proceed with that, and um, don't wait for any special invitation to do that, but uh, um, we're thankful today that we can meet together in uh, safety and in uh, uh, one accord in this chapel uh, to have a time of fellowship and, uh, and uh, social activity and a little bit of refreshment. Uh, study of the word and singing of his praises and so let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service today and uh, that he would just fill his this room this chapel with his presence today shall we Heavenly Father it's good to be in here in uh, at First Assembly Chapel Father in Victorville we ask you Lord that as we begin our service today you would just uh, touch hearts touch lives Touch us personally, Lord, in a new way, so that, Father, we would not leave this place unchanged uh, after being in your presence. We ask, Father, this afternoon that you would make yourself welcome in this place as we open our arms and our voices and praises to you to give you praise and glory for who you are to us today. Lord, minister by your spirit to each one personally, Lord, and we'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a few songs this afternoon. We hope you all know. So join with us in song as we sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. the different ones that I serve, that let's give the Lord a standing ovation. And, uh, but we're not going to ask the seniors to do that this afternoon because we uh, don't have any gentlemen here to help pick us up. So, <laughs> so here we are. And we're, uh, we're worshiping the Lord and singing of His mercies. And I bet you there's everybody in this room this afternoon that could give a testimony, a current testimony. I was thinking about that on my drive over here today. We used to have testimony services, usually on Sunday nights, but occasionally they'd break out Sunday morning too. 
And uh, it was telling about the good things that God had done in our lives and keeping it current. And, you know, not what happened back in the 40s and 50s, but what happened yesterday or today on the way to church. And uh, so um, this afternoon, uh, we're going to sing this next hymn that says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." just to take him at his word. is one of those songs that has been around for a long time, but a lot of times we need to be reminded of that fact again. So let's sing it together this afternoon and worship God as we do. See? 
Hallelujah. 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 Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? We love you today, Lord Jesus. We lift you up. We give you praises in this house. And we adore you today. stripes on his back for the healing of our diseases and the scripture says he is touched by the feelings of our infirmities that means the things that touch us that concern us he cares about and there are many needs on our prayer sheet today and many needs that have come in since that but we know that God is able and he is here to meet with his children we're our old children but he's here to meet with us so today, uh, Marion had sent a message, Marion Moore, regarding Ashley, her granddaughter. She's facing surgery just because of severe headaches to do something to alleviate that. So Ashley needs the Lord's touch today. And Georgia called in and said that her and Tom wouldn't be here because she's suffering from her COPD and it's uh, just got her down today. 
And also Al, uh, he's normally singing with us. Praise the Lord. The Lord really touched him if he followed us. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord really touched him in the hospital when he had a, what was it, in every aspect it seemed to be a pancreatic attack. But the Lord touched him, his blood pressure was sky high, the pain was way up there, and the morphine wasn't doing anything. And yet, God's people started praying, and gradually that blood pressure came down, the pain started to subside, and the Lord touched him, and after all the tests, the ultrasound or CT scan or something, one of those fancy ones he had, anyway, he showed nothing was wrong, and he has had pancreatic pancreatitis before so he knew what the pain was and the nurses were a little dumbfounded because they wanted to find something to prove it but God touched him and so today he's just uh, resting a little bit when you have a, an attack like that it takes a toll on your body and so he needs a touch from the Lord because he's got a cough that won't, won't allow him to sing really well into the microphone today so anyway, so we're praying for Elle. And then we got a call from, or a text from her daughter in Canada. Um, as you know, we had to move because our house we were ready and sold. And houses are selling just like that. And so we have two families, two kids, our son and daughter, and their families. Uh, so six children and two couples, and they share the same house. Well, the owner decided this is a good time to sell and the, the market is not, there's hardly anything available. There's seven homes in a city of like 250,000 or 300,000 people, seven single family homes available. So the, their daughter Maggie, the main concern is Maggie is really having anxiety. The minute the sign went up, people were in front of the house and that afternoon there were people coming for two hours just looking in. And so it's going to go fast. Um, but God has a place for them. And so the, the grandkids, the cousins have been dwelling in Canaan's happy land. You know, they can have fun in the backyard and all together and the moms can be supported by each other. So this is going to make a change, but we're believing the Lord to touch Maggie today. She's losing weight, nine years old, and she doesn't want to eat. And she had an anxiety attack that just was overcoming her today. So let's uh, pray together, believing that God knows all about these things and he knows all about the requests that have been brought before him on our, our prayer sheet. And also for the pastors in Canada, I watched the video today from uh, an interview about the pastor that was put in prison and made to sleep on the floor, on a cement floor, him and, and another pastor on a floor that had been urinated on and no pillows for 24 hours. Then an uh, officer came in and helped out for his shift. He gave him something, uh, gave him a cup of coffee, but they are being really mistreated in Canada. They're locking the doors of churches. Uh, if you have a big church, you could have 10, we could have 10 people gather in our church and that would be the limit. So they're uh, barricading the churches and arresting, uh, arresting pastors. So we need to pray that the believers will stand against this attack of the enemy. And uh, it's not because COVID is really rampant where they live. It's, it is in Toronto, but it's not everywhere. And so it's just created like a godless society is uh, glad to help shut those doors. So these officers were arrested and on the freeway pulled over, wrestled to the ground, and I watched an officer, officers do that in England to a, a person that was preaching on the street. He was taken off of his little stool and put on the ground and, you know, just treated really meanly, like you see criminals are treated. And then I saw in Germany, um, also online, uh, a person stood up and was reading their constitution and he was arrested for that. And he was wrestled to the ground and you could see the rough treatment. So we're living in a world that the enemy wants to keep the church down, but God's uh, word and his body is alive and well and we need to stand strong in our faith. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the one who holds our future. Lord, our hope and trust is in you. 
Lord, you are the mighty God, and greater is he that is in within us than he that is in the world. And in Jesus' name, we plead the blood of Jesus over every church and every pastor in this nation and in Canada and around the world. We pray your hedge of protection over them. Lord, that your word would go forward, whether the church has to go underground and grow like it has in China. Whatever will happen, Lord Jesus, help us to stand strong in our faith and stand for you, Lord, and for your word. We pray, Lord, for a harvest of souls to come into your kingdom, even in this time. We see many souls being saved, and we just believe you, Lord, that you are in control in our life, and our times are totally in your hands. And Lord, as your word says, you are coming for a church without spot or wrinkle, and that is looking for your coming. And we thank you for the word that says, look up for your redemption draws nigh. And Lord, we are watching for you, but we know we have to occupy till you come. Lord, we bring to you this need for Ashley. Lord Jesus, we pray in your covering over her, Lord Jesus. We just ask, Lord, for healing from these severe headaches that surgery wouldn't be necessary. Lord, we pray for wisdom, Lord Jesus, in anything that she could change in her lifestyle that would affect um, the headaches going away. And Lord, we ask for your hand to be upon her. We pray, Lord Jesus, for uh, Georgia today who's suffering with her breathing in her lungs. Lord Jesus, she's seen you touch her many times, and we just plead the blood of Jesus over Georgia, and we speak healing and life to those lungs in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, touch her where she's at and where her tongue are at. May they feel your presence. And we pray for Emmanuel today, Lord Jesus, with the, the report that he's receiving, Lord, that he uh, might have to have heart surgery. Lord, we ask for your divine healing touch to come upon him in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, gave us salvation through your death on the cross, but by your stripes that you took on your back, we receive healing. And in Jesus' name, we bind our faith together in agreement on your word that by your stripes, Manuel will receive a healing touch. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Lord, we pray for all the special needs that have been brought before us. Lord, you are greater and you are more than enough for everything that we everything that concerns us. Lord, we give you the rest of this meeting today. Let your sweet presence continue to hover over this place as we've gathered together in your name. We thank you, Lord, that you promise to be here. Bless Pastor Wayne as he breaks the word of life. And we pray, Lord, that the anointing of your Holy Spirit would come upon him to break any bondage that he would feel, any restriction that he would have freedom and liberty in your house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Us. And so we appreciate 
Let's ask the Lord's blessing on today's offering, shall we? Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house, to feel your presence, Lord. We ask now that you would continue to oversee what we're doing here this afternoon, Lord. Um, uh, minister by your Holy Spirit to our hearts today, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the gift and the giver today, and we ask, Lord, that you would take these monies and use them for extension of your kingdom around this world. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. and amen. Now the guys are going to be handing or not handing the bag to you because we're still under that that uh, restriction. And um, but I heard yesterday in staff meeting, pastors looking forward to the fact that by June the 15th we may see some loosening up, and so um, hopefully that will take place and we will be back to normal. Um, it's it's really scary to say we'll be back to normal when they said normal will never be what it was at the beginning of this. Remember that a year ago, March, and uh, so um, we take charge over that or authority over that in the name of Jesus and say the Lord is going to put us back to a normal state and He is going to be in control. Amen. So thank you for your tithes and offerings this afternoon and for your faithfulness to uh, give to uh, the ministries of the church and uh, the ministries uh, of the 13 campuses and uh, on the high desert and down into the, uh, the lower mainland and, uh, um, and the three new churches we're going to be opening this year um, uh, someplace. Um, and. Uh, so we look forward to that. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. And I'm going to be speaking today on the subject, turn out the lights, the party's over. Or when God turns out the lights. How about that? Does that grab your attention a little more? We're going to be studying Revelation today, so um, I'd like you to, to uh, when you get to Revelation chapter 18, how many are having trouble finding the book? Just wanted to give you a tip, it's, uh, it's at the back of the Bible, the last book of the Bible. Um, I think the index is back there somewhere too, and the maps. So if you go find the maps and then go left, you'll be good. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 18 of Revelation, so that's four chapters from the end. And uh, I want you to this afternoon, if you would uh, mark your Bibles when you find chapter 18 of Revelation, and keep your thumb or a marker there this afternoon, because we're going to be in and out of that chapter or this passage of God's Word today. So I'm taking my title from the, the uh, statement in, in verse 23 in the Amplified Translation that says, and never again will the lights of the lamp shine in you, and never again will the voice of the bridegroom and bride be heard in you. For your merchants were the great and prominent men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived and misled by your sorcery, your magic spells, and poisonous charm. Friends, there's a day coming when the one who is the light of the world is going to turn out the lights of this world. Amen? Now you remember that we talked in terms of there being code words in the Bible last week, and the code name that's used here for the world is Babylon. You see, in biblical thought, Babylon represents several things. Sometimes it represents a place. The city of Babylon is mentioned more than 260 times in the Bible, more than any other city with the exception of Jerusalem. Sometimes it represents a power. Babylon was the headquarters of one of the greatest kings who ever lived, Nebuchadnezzar. This was the city of the king who destroyed Judea, that destroyed Jerusalem, and that destroyed Solomon's temple. This city was the headquarters of the nation that took God's people into captivity. So one of the greatest kingdoms of all time was the kingdom of Babylon. But more than that, it also represents a philosophy. So first of all, it represented a place, then it represented a power, and now we see that it represents a philosophy as well. The first mention of Babel in the Bible is in Genesis for, uh, chapter 11. We're told that a man by the name of Nimrod built a tower that was meant to go all the way to heaven. This was man's first attempt at humanism. 
It was the first attempt to establish a kingdom, a state, a religion, a way of life, and a way of thought that totally excluded God. So in fact, the name Nimrod literally means to rebel. So Babylon is a picture of the spiritual, moral, intellectual, and philosophical rebellion of this world against God since the beginning of time. Nimrod, who was the ruler of the first Babylon, is a picture or a type of the Antichrist who will rule over the last Babylon. So we see that the city of Babylon, Satan's hellish city, is the counterpart of the New Jerusalem, God's holy city. But keep in mind that Babylon is used here as it's used in so many places in the Bible as a code word for any value system, any philosophical system, and any moral system that is anti-God, anti-Christ, and anti-Christian. Now, in chapter 17, we saw the fall of spiritual Babylon. But here in chapter 18, we now see the collapse of political and economical Babylon. The Bible predicts that in the last days, the economical and political substructure that holds this world together will collapse like a house of cards. This world of, of the last days is described as a city called Babylon. So let's take a closer look at the sin of this city for my first point. I want you to go over to Revelation 18, verse 5, where it says, For her sins are piled as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. Friends, the message translation states, Her sins stake to the high heaven. God has remembered every evil she's done. How's that for being literal? Sins stink to the high heaven. The stench of her iniquity has filled the nostrils of a holy God, in other words, causing the fire of his wrath and judgment to belch forth from his throne. Now, as John takes us for a walk through the streets of this city, we see more than bright lights and fast living here, friends. We see, first of all, in part A, a demonic city. Revelation 18, verse 2 says, He gave a mighty shout, Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. Um, that's pretty graphic language, isn't it? That's in the New Living Translation. But friends, we see here that this is a world of demonism and Satanism, and demons will be slinking all over the earth like ants at a picnic, and there will be an explosion of Satanism, witchcraft, astrology, astrology, and the occult. And in these last days, demons are going to have a hellish holiday, and there will be no place to run and hide. These demon hordes will be discharged from the very pits of hell and will lock up the world in their power. I'm glad we're not going to be here. Aren't you? Now, we know from history that Babylon was the home of magicians and soothsayers and spiritists and fortune tellers and astrologers. So we'll see in this day the reviving cults of Satanism, spiritualism, occultism, witchcraft, and astrology. People will worship the sun of the heavens, but they'll refuse to worship the Son of God who is in heaven. That just blows me away. We'll see kings and presidents who will chart their life by the stars, but will not worship the bright and morning star. Now, there are two things about people that never cease to amaze me. First of all, uh, what people will not believe. Um, I struggle with this with some of my family because they don't believe the way I do or we do. Um, and they typically want to get in an argument about it or a fight. And then secondly, it's what people will believe. And that goes hand in hand with the first one, amen? It alarms me that a person will not believe in the resurrection, but they'll believe in the incarnation. It blows me away that a person will not believe in creation, but will believe in evolution where we all come from monkeys. Well, just have to look at some of them and you can recognize that right away, can't you? And certainly the way some of them talk. <laughs> Sorry. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> now, <laughs> 
It anguishes me that a person will not believe in the grace of God, but they'll believe in the goodness of man. And how often has the goodness of man fallen down for us today or in days past? You can put your belief in the goodness of man and they will let you down every time, friends. And that's because the devil is the great deceiver and no one will be more deceived than the inhabitants of Babylon in these last days because it's going to be part B, a depraved city. Revelation 18 verse 3 tells us, For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Because of her desires for extravagant luxury, the merchants of the world have grown rich. Now, it's fitting that the sin of this city is described here as fornication. We talked about this last week. You'll remember that the word fornication not only translates to sexual immorality, but it also converts to spiritual idolatry. This modern day Babylon will be applauded as a liberated city by all of the fake news platforms that are out there, friends, that free it from the handcuffs of divine authority and godly morality. Their slogan is going to be, if it feels good, do it. If it looks good, watch it. If it sounds good, listen to it. And if it tastes good, eat it. This is going to be a city of spiritual rebellion, material obsession, and moral perversion, friends. Business will become opulent through the abundance of their, her excessive luxuries. And for a while, this city will look like the end of a rainbow where everybody can find their pot of gold. One of these luxuries whereby men will become rich is found in Revelation 18, verse 23, in the message where it says, the light from lamps never again. Never again laughter of bride and groom. Her traitors rob the whole earth blind, and by black magic, or sorceries in some translations, deceive the nations. Friends, the word for sorcery there, or black magic, is the Greek word pharmakia. The English word pharmacy is derived from that word, which literally means the use of drugs. So this is blatantly spelling it out for us by enlightening us that one of the tools that the Antichrist will use to deceive and control this world will be drugs. Folks, as we've read already, and we've seen happen with the legalization of marijuana or pot, I believe the Antichrist will decriminalize all drugs, not just your over-the-counter cannabis. It will be a major industry in that day, just as alcohol is a multi-million dollar industry today. Drugs always have been and always will be one of the devil's greatest tools because demonism and drugs go hand, hand in hand. Now, David Wilkerson, the founder of Teen Challenge and one, one of the foremost authorities on drugs, and particularly the drug use among teenagers, once said, and I quote, I have yet to see a person involved in Satanism who did not first open his mind to mystical experiences through the use of drugs, close quote. Friends, this will be a city whose God, small g, is gold, and whose creed is greed. Almighty God will be replaced by the almighty dollar because as 2 Timothy 3 verse 4 tells us, they will be treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It's as simple as that. Prices will be at an all-time high and headed there as we speak today, but values will be at an all-time low. How many have noticed that this has been a major shift during this last 18 months in our nation? let alone around the world. But let's look next at number C, a dangerous city. Revelation 18 verse four in the message tells us, just then I heard another shout out of heaven, get out my people as fast as you can so you don't get mixed up by her sin, so you don't get caught in her doom. Friends, right in the middle of the description of this city, there is God's call to separation. 
You see, there's an enticement or a, a glamour to this world, and it's kind of like the undertow or undercurrent of a lake or the, uh, uh, or the Colorado River. You first get into that water and you feel that gentle pull of the current, and it's so relaxing and refreshing when you're close to the shore, and at first it's so easy to resist it, but then as you go deeper, the pull gets stronger until you're finally caught in what's called the undertow. You're literally powerless to resist the pull and tug of that current as you're swept down the river or under the water. Friends, the world is just like that. Sin is just like that, amen? It'll take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. That's why God calls us to separate ourselves from the ways of this world. God warns us there, if you get mixed up in her sins, you'll also get caught in her doom. If you share in the world's sins, friends, you're going to share in the world's sorrows as well. See, sorrow follows after sin, just as sure as night follows day. Dr. R.G. Lee once wisely said, and I quote, you can eat the devil's corn if you want to, but he'll choke you on the cob. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You can eat the devil's corn if you want to, but he'll choke you on the cob. Friends, we need to remember that this world is not our home. We're just passing through, amen? We're not to be on the inside looking out because that's worldliness. We're not supposed to be on the outside looking in because that's envy. We're to be on the outside looking up. Amen? And Colossians 3 verse 2 tells us, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, I like how the message translation puts it. It says, so if you're serious about living this new re resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along eyes to the ground absorbed with things that are right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. I like that translation. I like what it's saying because it opens it up for us and it doesn't become so restricting. But the reason for this is because Philippians 3 verse 20 says, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. Amen? But as we move forward, we see that this is also a doomed city. Revelation 18 verses 5 and 6 says, For her sins are piled as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. Now watch this in verse 6. Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brew twice as much for her. I'd never seen that before. I mean, I'd seen it. I'd read it. But it never stuck out to me like that before. Now, Babel's tower didn't reach to the heavens, but her sins are going to, friends. She's in deep doo-doo, or deep trouble, if I might add. In fact, she's in double trouble, an unholy mess, if you will. Because for every sin that she's committed, she's going to be punished twofold, or twice as much as she would have. Friends, this is simply the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow, but you also reap more than you sow, friends, because in this world, God declares there's going to be a payday someday. Amen? So her destruction is going to be sudden. It's going to be sudden. So that means that her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. Revelation 18, verse 8 in the message tells us that in one day, disasters will crush her. Death, heartbreak, and famine. Then she'll be burned by fire because God, the strong God who judges her, judges her, has had enough. Friends, everything you see that is part of this world, one day is all going to burn and it's all going to go up in smoke. These people who are pouring their lives into this world as if that's all there is, 
reminds me of someone who'd be out rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic while it's going down. Have you ever known any folks like that? They busy themselves about stuff that doesn't matter. And, well, that's another thing that just blows me away. Now, don't understand me what I'm trying to say here. We should work to make the world a better place, yes. We should be doing all we can to win the drug war, to eliminate AIDS and other diseases, to work and pray for peace, to eliminate world hunger. But even though we should do all of that, I'm telling you this world isn't going to get better, friends. This utopic vision that certain dreamers have of what this world can be is like a mirage in a desert. Maybe you can see it, but you can never have it. Amen? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, and I quote, Apart from the second coming of Christ, the world is more likely to sink into a pandemonium than to rise to a millennium. That's serious stuff, folks. Next we see part E, a defiant city. And Revelation 18, verse 7 says, To the degree that she glorified herself, and reveled and gloated in her sensuality, living deliciously and luxuriously, to that same degree impose on her torment and anguish and mourning and grief, for in her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen on a throne, for, and I am not a widow, and will never ever see mourning or experience grief. That's a pretty lofty promise. So we can conclude from this passage that this city will be living high, wide, and handsome, singing out, let the good times roll, and it'll be as snug as a bug in a rug, and the whole world will have gotten on board without even realizing that it's sailing on a sinking ship. Now, friends, this fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 47, verses 8 through 11, that says this about Babylon, starting with verse 8. Listen to this, you pleasure-loving kingdom, living at ease and feeling secure. You say, I am the only one and there is no other. I will never be a widow or lose my children. Verse 9, well, both these things will come upon you in a moment. Widowhood and the loss of your children. Yes, these calamities will come upon you despite all your witchcraft and magic. You felt secure in your wickedness. No one sees me, you said, but your wisdom and knowledge have led you astray. And you said, I am the only one and there is no other. So disaster will overtake you and you won't be able to charm it away. Calamity will fall upon you and you won't be able to buy your way out. A catastrophe will strike you suddenly, one for which you are not prepared. Pretty grim picture, isn't it? Pretty grim. But my second point this afternoon, don't lose hope, it'll come to an end, is the sorrow of this day, or the, uh, the sorrow of this city, I should say. Friends, literally overnight, the snickers of laughter will become the cries of pity and sorrow as this city collapses. Now, to put this in perspective for us, I want to share this story. In 1929, an event took place. At one time or another, we've either heard about it or we've read about it. It happened on Black Monday. That clue's right there for you what it is. The day the stock market collapsed, triggering what we know today as the Great Depression. Well, I submit to you today that, that true, the true Great Depression, the true Great Depression to come is yet to come. It, you see, in the first Great Depression, we saw the collapse of just one nation's economy. But in this Great Depression we're talking about this afternoon, that the entire world is going to collapse and everything is going to fall apart. Everything. Now, three groups of people are directly affected by this, and their sorrow and wails will be heard from one end of this earth to the other. And all of them are going to be crying, Woe unto me! Woe unto me! But let's look closer, A, at the sorrow of the monarchs. Revelation 18, verses 9 and 10 reads, And the kings and political leaders of the earth who committed immorality and lived luxuriously with her 
will weep and beat their chests in mourning over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing a long way off in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, the strong city Babylon, in a single hour your judgment has come. Friends, when the Antichrist comes to power, there's going to be a centralization of wealth. There will be a one-world bank, a one-world currency, a one-world government, and a one-world economy. Remember that no one will be able to buy or sell without a certain mark, and that mark is the mark of the beast. When all the econo economies of all the nations are lined up under one head, friends, then all of these various kings will say, well, at last, we control all the world's wealth and all the world's money. Yet in one hour, the walls of faith, or wealth rather, will come tumbling down. They're going to come tumbling down. One hour. Now, there's going to be plenty to sell. But there's not going to be anybody to buy. For those who enjoy shopping, there's going to be bargains galore, but no money to pay for it. It'll be an economic collapse that will be heard and felt around this entire earth, friends, all over the globe. We could add a little takeoff here poem, you know, about Humpty Dumpty, while mighty Babylon sat on a wall. Mighty Babylon had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Babylon back together again. Revelation 18 verses 12 through 16 talks about the sorrow of the merchants, part B. The sorrow of the merchants. She bought great quantities, watch this, she bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant tie-in wood, ivory goods and objects made of expensive wood and bronze, iron, and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies. That is, human slaves. The fancy things you love so much are gone, they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. The merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. She was clothed in finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. Friends, with this passage, we're seeing a glimpse into the grandeur of this great city of Babylon. What opulence, what affluence, and what abundance. The world will be like one giant shopping center where if you've got the money, you can have practically anything you want. It'll be a day when supply will never equal the demand. The more people buy, the more they're gonna want. The more they want, the more they'll buy. But all of a sudden, in one hour, no one is buying and no one can sell. Inventories have gone up in smoke and investments have turned sour. Now, notice right in the middle of all this merchandise is listed in verse 13, and bodies, and that is human slaves. In some translations it says bodies and souls of men. Yeah, you read it correctly. In that day, just as in this day, friends, but more than ever before, men will be selling their very souls. Everything that men have sold their souls for, success, silver, sex, it's all going up in smoke. Friends, the loss of all these other things are replaceable, but the loss of a soul is irreplaceable. Now, I want you to marinate on that thought for just a minute. I found this poem in Wren's World of Inspiration. It says, to lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. But to lose one's soul is such a loss that no one, no man, can restore. 
Part C, The Sorrow of the Mariners. Revelation 18, verses 17 and 19, or 17 through 19 says, In one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors, and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was this ever a city like this great city? Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. The flags of the ships will be flying half-mast over the demise and the death of the city of Babylon. All business has come to a standstill. Walmart will have vaporized. No need for ships to move because there's no cargo to load or unload. The world's center of commerce has collapsed because there's no one to buy and no one to sell. The false bottom of Babylon's economic bucket has literally fallen out. The trade unions will be totally powerless, but up until that time, unions will go on strike so they won't work. But in that day, God will go on strike so they can't work. So let's finish up this afternoon and look at number three, the silence of the city. Folks, we're seeing a sneak peek of the curtain coming down forever on this city of sin. Revelation 18 verse 21 tells us that a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. <clears throat> I talked about millstones a couple weeks ago, but I was more intrigued by what a millstone might look like or weight, so I looked it up. and. They're obviously um, in different sizes, weighing anywhere between 100 pounds, and that was where we said the limit was a couple of weeks ago, but they range from 100 pounds to over 1,000 pounds. But this is what I found on average. <coughs> the combined weight of the two millstones there, bar and collars, came to 290 pounds even. Friends, this fulfills the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 51, verses 63 and 64, who said, when you have finished reading the scroll, tie it to a stone and throw it into the Euphrates River. Then say, in this same way, Babylon and her people will sink, never, to rise, never again to rise because of the disasters I will bring upon her. Then we're told to listen to the deathly silence that falls over this city. Friends, there will be no more music, part A. There will be no more music. Revelation 18, 22, the first part of that phrase says, the sound of harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. In other words, there will be no more entertainment or amusement and no more music. We see here that God is flat out sick and tired of being bombarded with all of the jive and the jazz of a world that has dishonored him and prostituted itself to other gods. So God is just going to shut down the band and pull all the plugs on the noise pollution. Ezekiel 26, 13 says, I will put an end to your noisy songs and the music of your harps will be heard no more. One translation says, and your parties, your famous good time parties will be no more. No more songs, no more lutes. But then it's not just, just the music folks, but there will be no more manufacturing. That's part B. No more manufacturing. Revelation 18.22b says, artisans or craftsmen of every kind, gone. You'll never see their likes again. The voice of a millstone grinding falls dumb. You'll never hear that sound again. This passage speaks of the wheels of industry finally grinding to a halt. Not one machine will be in operation. The factories will be silent. The machines will be dead. The night has finally come when no one can work. But that's not all. Part C, there will be no more marriage. Revelation 18.23 goes on to say, The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. 
The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. Friends, weddings are wonderful occasions of gaiety and glee. But the days of glee for this world will be over for good. The day of grief has come. We see here that the world's weeping will endure for a night all right, but there'll be no joy in the morning, friends. Now friends, I believe Revelation 18 is pretty much one gigantic commentary on 1 John 2 verse 17 where it says, this world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God, watch, will live forever. Say it with me, will live forever. Now there are two worlds, the world called earth and the world called heaven. Which one of these two worlds do you belong to? There are two cities, the old Babylon and the new Jerusalem. Where do you belong? There are two families, the family of God, and the family of Satan. Who do you belong to? You know, there's an old saying that says, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, I believe that's a little bit of bad advice. My advice to you today is put all of your eggs in the right basket and then watch that basket for your life. I advise you to put all of your eggs in the basket of God's sovereign grace today and then keep your eyes on Him. Amen? See, if we live to see this world fall apart, friends, if we live to see God turn out the lights, you can look up because your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your gracious word and your merciful word to us. Lord, it is meant as a warning. So we take this warning seriously today, Lord. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy to us. And Lord, it sounds scary, but when in fact it is not scary for those of us who are going to be gone, so Lord, we thank you for that safety feature that you've given to us through your word and through dying on the cross for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, we magnify your holy name. You are worthy of our praise. And we lift you up this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to stand for the blessing, if you would, please. I know that's always a chore. I'll give you a moment. Take your time. Take your time. We're not in a rush. Are we good? And now it just came to my mind, uh, don't have them stand, those that are unable to. Well, better late than never, I guess. <laughs> Folks, would you lift your hands for the blessing this afternoon? May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you and around you and within you because he is with you. He is with you. He is with you in the morning. He's with you in the evening. He's with you in your coming and in your going. He's with you in your weeping and in your rejoicing because he is for you, he is for you. And everybody said, amen. God bless you friends.
Thank you for coming. You're dismissed. I hope you enjoyed the dessert today. Have a magnificent evening. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone VF Assembly to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring His richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless. Keep praying.